We're going to share on communion. Uh, I'm, a lot of folk don't, oh, sorry, a lot of folk are not able to attend home church where we do have communion. And so we're going to be introducing communion once a month in the church. Not ideal. And you'll understand why as we go through communion. Most Christians have no idea about communion. Would that be a true or false statement? That most Christians do not know what communion is and what they understand to be communion is actually not. And that's quite a radical statement. And today I'm going to share again on communion. I did six months ago. And before that, six months prior to that, and still most people don't understand what communion is. So I trust by, through repetition, we will we'll grasp it, because saints, it is so incredible. And uh, hopefully you will get it today. So, let's pray that David and Nathan can sit down and the Spirit of God can take over. Amen. Absolutely, saints, we can do nothing of ourselves. Father God, Lord, we ask that you would teach us that which Jesus instituted for the church. Lord, help us, my God, not to be bound by tradition and give us understanding through your word. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would take your word and burn it upon our hearts, Lord. That we would understand this great commission, this great sacrament in Jesus' name. Help me to teach and help us all to hear, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Saints, I've shared before on tradition. Tradition is a destroyer of the things of God. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees when they questioned his disciples about the washing of hands, Jesus said to them that your traditions have made the word of God of no effect. Your traditions have made the word of God powerless. Your traditions have hindered God. So tradition can hinder God. Do we agree? Now most of us who are Pentecostal, come from a charismatic background, believe that we are totally free. We believe we are so free and so open to God that we can never be wrong. It's true. I've been around charismatics. Pentecostals are more teachable, not much more. But charismatics are really difficult. And so it's hard when we are confronted by having our doctrines challenged. So today I'm going to challenge your doctrine. If it hurts, thank God that Christ is the healer. But I really would want us as a church, as a body of believers, to understand this, what communion is about because it's going to change our coming together. If you, want to come, if you and I want to come together in the power of the Holy Spirit, with the presence of God, to see God move and touch lives, we have to understand Holy Communion. Are you ready? Ach, but after all, David, it's just sipping grape juice and getting a cracker out of your teeth. Not so. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 And we're going to take her from verse 17. Are there folk in this church that are hungry for the presence of God? Are there folk in this church who are sick and tired of coming together, same old announcements, songs, sermon, tea, home? Having a form of godliness but denying its power. Or having a form of godliness but not seeing its power. Right, well this message is for you and, for you and me then. The rest, you may quietly excuse yourselves. Alright. Chapter 11 verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. Since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says... I am going to now instruct you on Holy Communion. I'm going to instruct you about your coming together in your fellowship, or what we would call a church. And in doing and giving you these instructions, I am not going to praise you. In other words, what you're doing, the way you come together, 
the way you approach the Lord's table is wrong. Understand? Okay, it is wrong. Verse 18, he says, For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Divisions in church? Christians not being in love and unity? Really? Different churches and pastors warring with each other? Not true. Can't be. I mean, there can't be any person in this church who has ought against another. Not possible. Because the Bible says that we have been forgiven and we are not to have anything against anyone. So it's not possible that Christians could truly come together in worshipping of God with unforgiveness in their heart, with bitterness. Well, it happened 2,000 years ago and it's alive and well today. How can we, the church of Jesus Christ, profess to be Christians when we are warring with the church down the road? Or they're warring with us. And that church, and this church. Saints, these things are not to be so. The church of Jesus Christ is one body. We do not war against ourselves. How many of you punch yourself on a regular basis? If you do, you need to see a psychologist. It's abnormal behavior. We do not hurt ourselves. If you do, a psychologist will tell you you have a major problem. It's not deemed to be normal behavior. Therefore, the body of Jesus Christ should not be fighting with one another. So Paul says there are divisions, and you know what? I believe it. The church wasn't very old, and already there was segregation, division, backbiting, jealousy, contention, and all the fruits of the sin nature. Verse 19, For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. See, people follow people. Now, some of the people they follow are approved. Others aren't. But that's not this, what we're about. Let's get to the Lord's Supper. Verse 20. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, Paul is obviously uh, being sarcastic or bringing correction. He says, when you come together, it is, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. But they were coming together to eat the Lord's Supper. So what Paul is saying is, that although they were going through the motions, although they were eating proper bread and drinking large amounts of wine, they were doing, they were going through the motions of having wine and bread, but they were not taking the Lord's Supper. So it is possible to have communion and not have it at all. Drinking grape juice and eating bread is not communion. You understand that? There's more to the, the communion elements than just their substance and there's a whole lot more to what communion is about outside of the eating and the drinking. In verse 21, Paul now begins to teach and explain why he's saying they are not properly taking communion. He says, For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. Now, saints, just on that verse, we can see that the way they took communion in the time of the early church was that there was sufficient wine to get drunk on. Now, unless you have a seriously low tolerance for alcohol. There is no way that the standard 12 and a half millimeter communion cup that you can buy from any Christian bookshop is going to make you drunk. Even if it's full of 100% proof alcohol. So when they had communion, they had a meal. There were loaves of bread and there were cups of wine. Now I'm not saying we should have wine, not in the South African context, but in the culture and the context of the early church, it was fine. They never abused the alcohol. Well, the Corinthians did. But saints, firstly communion, you had bread and wine, not microscopic pieces of some compound made with flour and water and a thimble of grape juice. 
That is why we don't want to take home uh, communion in church. Because in home church where you've got 12 or 15 people, it's, it's okay to have a loaf of bread and break it up and have large glasses of grape juice, but if we did it here, it would be a logistical nightmare. We need to phone Albany Bakery and ask them to help us out. So proper communion was taking proper bread and proper glasses of wine or grape juice. Do we understand that much? All right. Not a major. That's just a by the by. Verse 22. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Verse 23. Paul now is explaining what Jesus taught him about Holy Communion. For those of you who are not aware, the Apostle Paul was never taught doctrine from any man. I, don't know, I think a lot of Christians are unaware of this truth. Paul never, ever sat under anyone's ministry. Paul never got taught anything from another Christian. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. That's what, that is what makes the writings of Paul so profound. Because Paul received everything directly from Jesus Christ. And he says as much in the book of Galatians in the first chapter. He says to the church, he says that this revelation he received, he received directly from Christ. And when he went to Jerusalem and he visited with the other, other apostles, he said, they added nothing to me. Which might sound arrogant, but what Paul was trying to teach the Galatians or share with the Galatians was he was trying to say to them that I have been given the gospel, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, deep was his revelation that Peter writes that the teachings of Paul are sometimes difficult to understand. They were, his understanding and revelation of the word of God was incredibly profound. So he says in verse 23, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So why do we break bread? To remember Jesus Christ. Now, let me expound that. The breaking of bread is not a time to repent. The breaking of bread is done in remembrance of Jesus. Now right, re, go back to that verse and read it again. Because you haven't got it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat the bread in remembrance of what I have done for you. It's got nothing to do with examining yourself. Which is what we all do. Mm. And it's not biblical. But don't. I know we, what, some of you got a question. I know what your question is. Don't ask it. We'll get there. Verse 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying... This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. So when we eat the bread, when we drink from the cup, we do it in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. We do it in remembrance of the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God toward us. Communion is a time of thankfulness, worship, remembrance, glorifying God, speaking of the greatness of God. It's a time of remembrance, not a time of getting right, which is what you have been incorrectly taught. All right, how's your religious spirit doing? How are your traditions? A bit bashed. Should we stop and continue next week? Can you handle it? It's horrible being challenged. Nobody likes to know that they've been wrong all their lives. But it's not your fault. Remember, everything you learned you le and I learned, we received from somebody. Most of us, I should say. Mm, no. Not all of us. Most of us. 
Okay, so we don't. So it's not your fault. You've been taught incorrectly. So it's not. Don't take it personally. Verse 26 says, "For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes." Every time you drink of the of the wine or the grape juice or eat of the bread, you're proclaiming the Lord's death. You're, it's, it's all about Christ. The, 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 the Jesus Christ died for us. He died to take up for Himself a people who would become adopted as the sons and daughters of the living God through faith in Him. And that He's returning for a bride. Our home is in heaven. Every time you drink of that cup and you eat of the bread, it's, oh God, one day I'm going to eat this bread in front of you, but different bread. It's a time of being Christ-centered, Christ-focused, speaking about the goodness of God, talking about Jesus. But what we do in the church is making sure, you know, everyone stops repenting of their sins before we put the thimble of grape juice in our mouth and dissolve the wafer on our tongue so it doesn't get stuck in our teeth. But that is not communion. You all understand it. Let's continue, because you've only got a half of communion so far. Verse 27, the question that you all wanted to ask. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So there's a way of taking communion that holds you accountable for Christ's death. In other words, God is not going to be gracious to you. If you drink of the Lord's cup in an unworthy manner, you can be guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus. Wow, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Now, none of us want to be guilty of the Lord's death. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. That when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order for when I come. Now, it is... Vital, we understand, verses 27 to 33. Saints, the way we've been taught to take communion is before we partake of the elements, we need to examine our heart. That is how we were taught. Is that correct? And then once we have made right with God, we may partake. Correct. Correct. That's what we were all taught. But let me explain to you, or tell you this, we were all wrong. That is not how we take communion. You see, biblically, what God was trying to explain was that before you come together, you examine yourself. The examination does not take place before you break the bread, before, sorry, before you eat. The examination takes place before you ever get to the meeting. Before you ever get to where the the body of Christ will be meeting. So whether it's home church, whether it's going to go see friends, because that's when we should be taking communion. When Christians come together, you should have bread and grape juice as often as you come together. When Christians come together, you're having church. Again, another tradition that we have is church is only when you're sitting in pews. No, church doesn't have to be uncomfortable. You can have church around a dining room table. You can have church in your living room. But we are to examine ourselves before we, part, before we actually enter into the place where we are coming together. You see, saints, God is a holy God. God will only be present where His people live in righteousness. God can only be present when His people are in unity. Psalm 133, that where there is unity, God commands His blessing. Did you know that? Have you, are, is anybody not familiar with Psalm 133? 
how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the oil flowing from Mount Hermon, like the oil flowing from the beard of Aaron down his garments and onto his feet. For there the Lord commanded a blessing. That's a paraphrase, but it's probably about 85% right. But where there is unity, God commands his blessing. So if we examine ourselves before we come together, we deal with unforgiveness, we deal with strife, we deal with bitterness, we deal with whatever is in our hearts that needs to get dealt with. So when we come together, we're in unity. Our heart is right before God, and God can command a blessing, and God can be present because God is a holy God. And God dwells in holiness. Without holiness, the writer of Hebrews tells us, it is impossible to see the Lord. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. And so communion was instituted for a number of reasons. Firstly, it made sure that the heart of God's people was right when they came together so that God could be present to fellowship with them. God is not going to fellowship with his strife. I think Barnett, when he spoke here three weeks ago, told a wonderful joke about the, the guy that goes to the, the church in a cowboy outfit. Did you, how many of you remember that joke? I don't know, the pastor said, you know, have you prayed to God about your dress? It happened on two occasions. The third time, you know, God said, listen, I've never been to that church. I don't know what the dress code's like. You see, God doesn't always dwell where Christians come together. Don't think that God is present when Christians come together always. That's a radical statement. Doesn't anyone want to challenge that? You accept that? Without scripture? Well, I'll just give it to you. <laughs> because some of you are too scared to ask. In the book of Revelation, a number of times Jesus says to some of the churches, He says, I will take my lampstand from you. I will no longer dwell amongst you. I will remove myself from you. So in other words, you'll meet together, but I will not be present. Saints, I've seen that happen in churches where God withdraws himself and he's not present. We're all going through the motions and you, you can sing the same songs as another church where God is present, but it's the flesh. And the flesh is ugly. It really is. You can even pray in tongues in the flesh. It's horrible. It's a noise. It's raucous. So saints, God wants his church to come together in holiness, in righteousness, in truth, in love, in unity. And communion is a preparation for that. Now, how many times do you think the early church had communion? Daily. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that the disciples continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. It says in verse 46, So continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Daily they would break bread. Daily they would remember Jesus. Daily they would talk about God. Daily their hearts would be prepared to meet with Christ. Isn't that glorious? We only do it once a month to fit into our church program. Saints, if we had proper church, our services would be three to four hours long. That's why we don't do communion properly because most Christians are not that committed to God. They barely can get to church on a regular basis. Can you imagine if our services were three or four hours long and we pr truly had communion? See, because communion is about glorifying Jesus. It's coming together with your hearts prepared, every sin confessed, in righteousness, in holiness, in fellowship with God, and you bring that relationship that you have with the Lord and the rest of the brethren bring that relationship in, and then you start having church. But what we do as Christians, we come to church and we haven't spent time with the Lord. Our hearts aren't right. There's strife, there's division, there's unforgiveness, there's all sorts of stuff in our life. And we come together and we wonder why God's not present. Is it any mystery? Now, saints, I'm not rebuking you. I'm speaking to me myself as well. Right? I'm not, you know, I, I too have need of teaching. But saints, do you hear what God was trying to institute with communion? He wanted the church to come together with the right spirit. And if the spirit is right, 
If our hearts are right, then God will be present. Now let me go a little bit deeper, because that's the surface. Do you all understand that much? Is there any confusion? This is, let's just try to be open. If there's a question that you, you, you're too scared to ask, just knock somebody next to you and say, please ask him this question. Nobody's going to be shouted down. But I really want us to understand this. Do you all understand thus far? Communion, when we take communion, is not a time of preparation. The preparation, the examining of one's heart should have been done before we come together. So that when we do come together, there's a spirit of unity, there's righteousness, and there's an expectancy for God to move. Because God will not move or be present in unholiness. Okay. That's the foundation. Now, if you're comfortable with that, we can go a bit deeper. That's fine, as long as that person does not take communion. And we'll get into that. As long as they do not take communion. So, let's... We looked at... In verse 27, it says that we can become guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. We can take communion in such a way that we are going to be held accountable by God for Christ's crucifixion. In other words, instead of receiving grace because of the crucifixion, we will be held guilty... There are two camps here. Those who through the cross have been forgiven and those who will be held guilty for the crucifixion. You got that? It's awfully quiet in here and I hope you're thinking. <laughs> right. is, it, is it too warm? You're all comfy? All right. If it feels like a fire, then that's not me. That's just God. <laughs> Verse 28 says... Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Right, now here where it becomes a little bit deeper. We are told to examine ourselves before partaking of communion. And then Paul goes on to say, he says in verse 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Not that God judges you, but you bring the judgment upon yourself. In other words, you allow God, you make God, you cause God to bring judgment upon you because you do not discern the Lord's body. Now here is where, Dave. That's strong. Bring damnation, which is what it is. Judgment from God, in that, and that's, thank you Dave, that's excellent. Thank you for bringing it up. Because we're speaking not about God's going to slap you on the wrist. It's talking about your eternal future. If we don't discern the Lord's body. Now, what does it mean to discern the Lord's body? I mean, after all, this is cream crackers made by Baker's Biscuit, subsidiary of national brands. Top selling savory snack in South Africa. Right? That's all it is. I don't see anything spiritual about this, and it's grape juice. In fact, it's not even series. It's a local brand. That's pretty good, this still. How do you bring judgment not to see in the body? It's not about the bread. It's not about the grape juice. It's about what they represent. And here, I want you to walk with me. In the book of Genesis, way, way back in the... He was the 15th chapter, the 14th chapter, sorry. 14th chapter and verse 18, Abraham comes back from a battle, and most of you know the story. If not, you can read it. Aaron comes back from a battle with, with the spoils of, of the battle and an individual meets him whose name is Melchizedek. In English, in Hebrew, Melech Tzedek. And he's named Melech in the Hebrew it means king and Tzedek means righteousness. He is king of righteousness. It is Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, 
meets Abraham. And he brings out, the Bible says, bread and wine. He brings out bread and wine and he blesses Abraham. Saints, bread and wine are elements of covenant that God makes. Bread, in the Hebrew, is lechem. Jesus was born where? In Beit Lechem. Beit, the Hebrew's house. Lechem, bread. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Beit Lechem. Because Jesus told his disciples and the Pharisees, I am the bread of life. I am the true sustenance that you need to live for eternity. If you want to live for eternity, you have to eat of my bread, my body. You need to consume yourself with me. When God makes a covenant with Abraham, he uses the elements of bread and wine, which will be symbolic of his own being, of his own person. Wine represents the blood of Christ that will be shed for many. And so bread and wine represent the body of and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So although this bread at no time becomes the body of Christ as the Roman Catholic Church preach, they teach in transubstantiation. It means simply in English that the bread literally, not figuratively, literally actually becomes the body of Jesus. That is what the Roman Catholic Church preach. That the bread takes, stops being bread and becomes the body of Christ. So they are guilty of cannibalism. Not only that, of crucifying again and again and again and again and again the Lord Jesus Christ. Very bad. So the bread and wine only are elements. They represent representations of the physical body and the literal blood of Jesus. Now, bearing that in mind, turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. How do I take of communion not properly discerning the Lord's body? Remembering, what does the bread and wine represent? The body and blood of Jesus. So the bread and wine become what? Correct. They become symbols of covenant. Do you get that? When I take the cup and I take the bread, I don't want to touch it and maybe somebody has to eat, to eat it. So it will be anointed. You'll be slain. <laughs> when I take these elements, I'm taking the elements of covenant. Do you understand that? And God takes covenant real serious. Very seriously. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, I'm going to read from verse 34 to 39. The Lord Jesus says these words, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I do not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes will be those of his own household. Isn't that wonderful? That's glorious. Sweet Jesus, our lovable, delicate Lord, has come to bring division, has come to bring enmity. That can't be true. Should we just tear that out of our Bibles? It just doesn't go with the nature of Christ, as we have been taught. Verse 30, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, if I love what my parents have taught me, if I love the culture, religion, and tradition of my parents more than the words of Jesus Christ, I am not worthy of Jesus. You see, we get our cultural and religious and our moral identity from 
our parents. If you love mother or father more than Jesus, you're not worthy of Jesus. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If your family comes before Christ, if you will compromise Jesus for the sake of your children, you are not worthy of Jesus. Does that sound harsh? That's a whole lot different from dear Jesus coming to my heart. I think Jesus wants more than your heart. Verse 38, and he says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life, verse 39, will lose it. And he who loves his life for my sake will find it. And saints, that is where the church misses it, not only in salvation, but certainly when it comes to communion. You see, because the elements represent symbols of covenant, when we take of the emblems, we are reminding ourselves of a covenant that we have or do not have with God the Father through the body of Jesus. Did you understand that? When you take of the elements, you are reminding yourself, you are proclaiming, to the heavens before the throne of God the Father that you are in covenant with Him through faith and absolute surrender to Jesus. The only way you and I can be born again is to lose our life, is to surrender every iota of our being to His Lordship. If Christ is not Lord of all, then, as you know how the cliche goes, he's not Lord at all. Jesus did not die on a cross, did not suffer pain, humiliation, and above all, separation from the Father, so that he can come live in your heart. He went through the agony of the cross and the separation from the Father, so that he can be Lord of all your life. You see, no, it's no good. Your heart belonging to Jesus and your head to yourself. I think I mentioned this last week, didn't I? It's no good. Your heart belonging to Jesus and your wallet belonging to yourself. My heart belongs to Jesus, but my eyes belong to my lust. And that's why the church is so fraught. Because we've all lost Jesus into our little hearts. Well, don't you know that your heart is deceitful and wicked above all things? Do not know that out of the heart proceeds murders and adulteries and envies and Christ does not want to be Lord of your heart. His heart did not go on the cross. His whole being went on the cross. Jesus wants all our lives and we can only be in covenant with Him when we surrender all. A life for a life. Don't tell me I'm a Christian but it's fine to go live like the world. I'm sick and tired of people saying, I'm a Christian but I believe in tattoos. Who's been reading the Bernani City Times? Ach man, you're not a Christian. You're a mucho. I hope that's not derogatory. Sometimes I use words from other languages that actually are a lot more serious. Okay. Saints, a Christian is one who has surrendered all to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's one who has emptied themselves of their own desires to take up the purposes of Christ. And the truth of the matter is in the charismatic Pentecostal churches, if 30% of those people are born again, it's a lot. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make as many converts to Christ as is possible. Right? Because that's how we get financed and funded. That's how we get our names in lights. That's how we get invited to the next charismatic convention. Because we're going to Africa and we make 4 million decisions for Jesus. Praise the Lord! 25 million in Nigeria. What have you made? Decisions. Well, as quickly as they decide to follow Jesus, they'll decide not to the next day. Christ did not call us to go into all the world, preach the gospel and make decisions for Him. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Now, saints, I know it sounds like I'm being critical, but I'm not. I'm trying to illustrate where the church has fallen way 
way, way, way past the standard of God. Christianity was never meant to be popular. It was never meant to be appealing. It was never meant to entice. Christianity was meant to be a stumbling block. It was meant to be foolishness to the wise. It was meant to be an object or a religion that was hated by sinners. But we have made it, trying to make it popular. Well, you see, the Lord Jesus Christ loves you all. Please, saints. God's a good God. We're all going to go to heaven. When challenged, are you saying Jesus Christ is the only way? All I know is God is good. Please, saints. Christianity is not supposed to be popular. To be a born-again believer requires you all. And there are too many people sitting in churches thinking that they're saved who have not the first idea of salvation. Because they are just the same person they've always been. There's been no change of heart. The Apostle Paul says, if any man or woman being Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. And we have people sitting in church who are not changed. There's no revelation of Christ in their hearts. There's no changing in their hearts. They're still the same person they were before coming to Jesus. And they're glorying hallelujah and they think they're on their way to heaven. No, saints. If you have not had an encounter with Christ, if your heart has not been changed, if you do not know that something has happened, saints, you're not born again. You are not born again. And don't feel bad. That's okay. I said the sinner's prayer once. It didn't do anything to me. Because I was, I was not ready to surrender my life to Christ. I just wanted to get out of the church. I would have done cartwheels if that was what was required. See, God doesn't want an insurance policy. These emblems do not speak of an insurance policy. If there is a God, and if I do die, and I might go to heaven. God wants a life. A life for a life. And Arthur often speaks about the five foolish and the five wise virgins, virgins that in the church there are those who are full of the Spirit and those who wish they had the Spirit. But saints, to serve Jesus costs you everything. And so, coming back to... Now, I'm, so I'm preaching the gospel to you. And I'm not trying to do it to hurt. I'm trying to share the gospel as the apostles would have shared it, as the guys like Wesley and Finney would have shared it. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, a life for a life. Now, Christ gave his life. If you will not take up your own cross and follow after me, you're not worthy of me. A cross, saints does not speak about being persecuted for your faith, as many of us have been taught. Many of us have been taught that we've got to pick up our cross when people are horrible to you, when people persecute, they say, oh, well, just pick up your cross. That is not what the cross represents. It is not what Jesus was saying. When Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he was saying, as I'm going to pick up my cross and die, so you better take your cross and die to your own life so that you will live for me. Because I want to be Lord of your life, but I'm not going to be Lord of your life while you're Lord of your life. Do you get it? While you're in control, Christ cannot be Lord. You know, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And even that kingdom is just you. It cannot be you on the throne and Jesus. One thing about the Lord, He doesn't believe in this African understanding of government. You know, two prime ministers, two presidents. And Christ... Okay. I'll be Christ is Lord of all. Or not Lord at all. That is why the Apostle Paul then says, in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 11, But let a man or a woman examine himself or herself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup... For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now here comes the judgment. When we don't understand what these elements represent, when I pick up the cup of grape juice and I have the bread in my hand and I eat and I drink and I say, Jesus, you my Lord and I'm in covenant with you and I'm not. We bring, we bring judgment. God says, who speaks. Who are you to 
proclaim that you're in covenant with me. You're an imposter. That's my hypocrite. Is that harsh? It's the Bible. The Bible was never meant to be pleasant. Saints, the Word of God was meant to cut into our hearts. The, meant to, the Word of God was meant to cut like a knife between the division of soul and spirit, to separate the soul, that is man's logic, man's understanding, and separate it from the spirit where God seeks to dwell so that there would be a discerning of what comes from the world, what comes from the enemy, what comes from my own thought, and what comes from God by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is meant to cut and separate so we can discern, is this man speaking? Is this God speaking? And so if the Word cuts, it is good. But we in the church have been selling Christianity. We've been dishing it out so we can build our kingdoms and our big churches and our whatever. And we don't discern the Lord's body and we feed the flock. We feed people communion, damning them to hell because we don't teach them to discern the Lord's body. Now saints, if you come to this church and you've been here more than twice, it's because you really want to get serious with God or you've been dragged here. Alright, so if this is your first time, we may not see you next week. But that's okay. Because only you can choose God. We can't choose Him for you. Saints, this is, the communion is a precious time. We come together and our hearts have been checked. We're in relationship with God. We're at peace with mankind. Isn't that not glorious? And then God will be present. Let us discern the Lord's body. Am I in covenant? Do I truly desire to be surrendered to God? Saints, let me be completely honest with you. I am not perfect. I'm far from perfect. But I want... No, I know it comes as a great shock. But, <laughs> but saints, one thing I can say of my heart. I want God and I want His Lordship above anything else. And I will, I don't, I will humble myself. I will not hide anything from anybody or from God Himself because I want the Lord. And despite all my weaknesses and all my failings and all my shortcomings, all I want is Christ's Lordship. I don't have an agenda I don't have an ambition except to be everything God wants me to be. That is my heart. And it should be no different from anyone else's in this hall today. That is the heart of a Christian. My God, all for you. doesn't mean we've arrived. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're super saint. God looks at the direction of the heart. Does your heart hold fast the covenant that Christ made with humanity? to those who will believe, to those who would surrender, to those who would yield themselves to Him. That's all God's asking. Where is your heart? Where is my heart? Let us examine ourselves before we come together, whether it be to home church, whether it be to a prayer meeting, whether it be come to church, whether it, goes, whether, it means, whether it be going to fellowship over a cup of coffee with another Christian. Let us examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And it's not a hard examination. You see, at the end of the day, all you and I can offer God is our desire. That's all we have for God. Do you desire Him or don't you? Many of us are trying to get to a place where we can be good enough for God to receive us. Well, you don't have enough lifetimes for that to happen. You'll never be good enough. None of us will be good enough. But we can desire to surrender all. We can say, Lord, I want your Lordship. Take everything out of me that is a hindrance. All God wants is our desire. If you desire Him with all your heart, and you genuinely desire His Lordship, and you're willing to be challenged by His Spirit, you're in covenant. So it's not hard, saints. It's not to be perfect, it's to be yielded. It is to want His Lordship. It is to confess His Lordship. It's to say, Lord, take my life. Okay, is it, is that, is that, are you understanding that? I'm not trying to tell you it's impossible to be saved. It's not. It's very easy to be saved. 
Just die and you'll be saved. Just surrender your life. Just say, Lord, no, I'm not doing it my way. You see, pride must, pride cannot stand in the presence of God. Pride is me. Flesh and blood cannot stand in the presence of God. I must humble myself. And that is what communion is. It's a, it's a, it's a perpetual reminder of what Christ has done. Because on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took the bread, Matthew said, and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he blessed it. And he said, Baruch Adonai Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the ground. Anybody gone to a bread farm? Where they grow sliced, low GI bread? Not. No, Christ was, Jesus was praying a prayer that at, at the time of his coming was at least 500 years old. Prophet, prophetic prayer that Jews even today pray when they break bread. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread of, uh, the bread of bread from the ground. Blessed are you, God, who will resurrect me, for the grave will not be able to hold me, for I will purchase for them redemption and salvation. And as I am resurrected, so they will be resurrected. Eat, eat, share in my resurrection. For those of you who will eat and surrender all. In like manner, he took the cup and he blessed it. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Porei Pri Agathen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Who creates the church. The fruit of my blood, the fruit of my sacrifice, will be a people adopted unto God. A holy nation, a royal priesthood, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, blood-washed saints of God who will partake in death as I have died. They will give up their lives that they may have life. They will lose their life for my sake that they may have life. And through my blood and through the partaking of my life, I will create the church, the fruit of the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches, the branches cannot bear fruit of themselves. And this they abide in the vine, abide in me, and I in you, says the Lord. Without me you can do nothing. John 16, sorry, John chapter 15, portions thereof. And that's what we do, we take communion. And we come rejoicing that we are washed by the blood of Jesus, that we are loved by God, we have become adopted as children of the Most High. That the blessings and the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ for my life. That is why we can be healed through communion. Because it's a reminder of covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. So when I take the bread, saints, I've got to tell you this, as you sit or you stand with your, your Christian friends, your Christian brothers, as you're munching on the bread, I've got to tell you what Christ has done and what Jesus did for me today. I've got to tell you about the Lord. And that's what communion is. It's a time of sharing of the goodness of Jesus. It is a time of speaking about His goodness. It's not this thing. What we, that's the thing we're being taught, that we, like little mice, nibble on a minuscule piece of stale whatever. It's a time of coming together and glorifying God, speaking about Him. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 26, and I'm going to close with this because I can go on for the next two days. And this is a good subject. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Do you know that word proclaim in the Greek? Praise God. Now, for those Greek members amongst us, would you have mercy? As I... It is... The Greek word that sounds similar to katagelo. 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 Okay. Something like that. Ne? Do you know what katagelo means? Of course you don't. 
I'll tell you. It means to declare, to preach, to speak of. Community is to preach, declare, and speak of the Lord's death till He comes. Taking communion is a speaking, proclaiming, talking, chatting, testimony, glorifying time. And what does the church do? Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Yes, you have, and you should have dealt with that before you came to the church. Do you see how different it is? Now, I'm sure many of you are now ready to leave the church. But tradition holds us in bondage and separates us from God. We examine our hearts and we come together, we come in unity, in righteousness, and the presence of God can be amongst us. And that is what communion is about. So, for those of us whose hearts not prepared their hearts, today, and today only, we'll, we'll give you opportunity. If you need to line up and just pull out your heart and say, David, I've been so angry with you this whole week and last week and the last three years. I forgive you anyway. You don't have to come forward. Um, but saints, when you, come to home, when you go to home church in the week, prepare your hearts. And home church leaders, communion should be the very first thing you do. It should be the very first thing you do in your home churches. Please, it should not be at the end, an afterthought. You begin, and I'm going to, well, I keep saying close, but it's a relative word. We prepare our hearts so we come together, our hearts are right. We then break bread, and as we break bread, what we do, we testify of the goodness of God. We speak of His goodness. We remember he, all the things He has so freely done for us in Jesus. What does that do to your heart? When I, when I start speaking about Jesus and how good He is and how merciful and I can't believe that God would take a rotten sinner like me and, and save me and love me. When you start sharing, you gotta, I've got to tell you what Jesus did for me this week. What does it do? Our hearts become encouraged. And you know what we want to do now? We want to worship. Now I want to worship God. And so from communion, we're going to true worship. You see, not program. So many of us are program driven. We start with praise, get ourselves all shook up and get ourselves loose to worship the Lord. Right. And then, you know, we've broken our little, now we're not so self-conscious. Why? Because I've clapped my hands. Okay, and once I've done the, the charismatic little jiggle, right, then, Lord, I love you. And so we, we've got to, that's program. Now, but communion, your heart is prepared. And you enter into worship, it's, just, it's an overflow, because we're constantly reminded of God's goodness. We're constantly in His presence as we speak about His goodness. And the program drops away, and the presence of God comes in, because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that is what our Christianity should be, free. Not trying to manipulate the atmosphere. Yeah. While the music plays. Yeah, and then, uh, are there any questions on communion? I know I've tried to make it a little bit humorous, which is very out of character, because I really want you to understand what communion is. Are there any questions? And let's we are a family now. Does anybody have any questions on communion? Is it fully understood? Auntie Gay. It should overflow. Communion should be a time of thanksgiving, a time of, it's just, it should be church. You see, Paul calls it this. He says, how is it when you come together, one is a song, one is a tongue, one is an interpretation, one is a prophecy, one is a teaching. And that is one, that's 1 Corinthians 14, speaking about that's what church should be like. So, so yeah, yes, you can have thanksgiving on your heart. That's how it should be. All right, so now that we've destroyed the whole concept of church as we know it. Go to home church and start having communion and fellowship with God. We'll do it once a month in the church for those of you who are not able to go to home church. 
For those of you who don't want to go, we'll sit to All right. Is that it? No questions? So you all understand it. John. Absolutely. Do you hear Jonathan's question? What happens if somebody comes to home church and they're the only ones not partaking and so they partake of communion because they don't want to feel sort of like the odd one out and they don't want to draw attention to themselves? Is it the responsibility of the folk in the home church to speak to them? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are to explain if somebody that's unsaved comes into our midst and we, we explain what commun- we need to explain to them what communion is. And then give them the opportunity to surrender their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to be born again. What a glorious way of being saved. So, excuse me, it should be used as an opportunity. So we don't encourage, in fact, we discourage anybody from taking communion if they are not truly born again. If you have not made that decision to surrender all to Jesus you may not take communion in God's sight, or else you will eat and drink judgment upon yourself. Tyrone. What about children? That's a, the classic. Well, we all know what the religious people say. It's exactly what the disciples said. No children near Jesus. Let's see how, what we've taught you over the last three years. What about children? Should children take communion? Let's see a show of hands. Who says children should not take communion? <laughs> Who's just plain scared to be wrong? Okay. <laughs> Saints, of all people, of all God's lovely humans, the ones most qualified to take communion are all children. The Bible says, because of such is the kingdom of heaven. I said, children, young children, I certainly have no problem with, especially the little kiddies, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let them have communion. 12, 13, uh-uh. No. They make, make up their mind. Little kids, absolutely. Do not forbid them to come to the Lord. Because their hearts are right. They should die, they'll go straight to heaven. Okay. And I don't care what any Pope, Bishop, Cardinal, Apostle, Prophet, or any other self-appointed megalomaniac says. All right. Praise the Lord. Providing that that person that they invite understands what meeting they're going to and they have a desire to learn more about Christianity. I think, as I said, it's a wonderful opportunity to preach the gospel. You see, it's different from who wants to be born again in this hell. It's different. It's, It's a life for a life. And many of us are not experiencing the fullness of being a Christian because we have not made that decision to surrender all. All right, so have you got a better understanding of communion? And are coming together. Praise the Lord. Well, there you go. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Saints, we are to preach the gospel. The gospel of life, the gospel of peace, but we are to preach it correctly. All right. No more asking people to invite Jesus into their hearts. Please, I beg you. It's a life for a life. Are you willing to surrender all to Jesus Christ that He can be Lord of your life? That is what it is to be born again. And if you need to pray a prayer, Lord, take my life, and it sounds like a sinner's prayer, that's fine. But it's a heart decision first. Okay. All for Jesus. That's it then. Can we have the ushers and those who are going to be serving communion? Saints, while they're dishing out and you need to get your heart right, do take the opportunity and let's just hold the cups and the bread until we've all got and then we can uh, partake. If you are not born again, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, I would encourage you, please don't take. And if you want the Lord to be, 
if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, all you've got to do is where you are, ask Him. Or better still, come speak to one of the elders after the meeting. Saint says you're just getting ready. Uh, remember, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, you need to deal with that. Strife, bitterness, you need to deal with it. The Bible says if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. So let's make sure that there's nobody that we have anything against, that we have harbor any bitterness towards. Has everybody got bread? If you don't have, just raise your hand very high. That's everybody. Grape juice? Has anybody not got grape juice? Just put your hand up. Just like this. And the usher will come to you. Thanks, Michael. That's just bread. Just And for the little children who come in afterwards and they want to drink the grape juice and eat the bread, parents, it's okay. All right? It's not holy. They're not going to get struck down with some dreadful disease. They make crumbs, that they'll get a smack, but they won't get a disease. All right, so please, afterwards, if the little kids want to have some, do not forbid anyone, please. All right, has everyone been served? Right, this will be the last time we do it religiously. Is that okay? Okay. Saints is a time of glorifying Jesus. You see, I'm trying to break the, I'm not being disrespectful, I'm trying to break the religious spirit. 
There's a religiousness about serving God. Lord, as we come before you, Father, thank you for your incredible mercy, your love, your goodness. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity, my God. For there you have commanded a blessing. And Father, we want our hearts to be knit one to another, but above all, Lord, to be knit to you. And as we hold these elements, my God, the bread and the, the grape juice in our hands, Lord, we want to remember your goodness. We thank you, my awesome Father, our Father, Lord, that you in your mercy and grace have redeemed us unto yourself. Lord, that you have forgiven us our transgressions. In fact, you said you remember them no more. How wonderful and how glorious, my Lord, for we see ourselves as wicked and sinful. We see ourselves as so unworthy, and we are. But Lord, your love and the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from every sin, and you have adopted us. And Lord, that you have come to dwell in us by your Spirit, that cries out in our hearts, Abba, Father, for we know in whom we believe, and we know, my God, to whom we belong. And so, Lord, as we hold these elements and begin to partake of them, we want to glorify you, thank you, and worship you, Lord, that you are the soon and coming King. And we ask that you would dwell amongst us, Lord, that you would tabernacle amongst your people. In Jesus' name. And after we finish this, Lord, and go into worship, receive our love offering, my God. In Jesus' name. Saints, partake.